So um, hello and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining me for this presentation. Um, I think I know most of the people here, but in case anybody's on the call who, who I haven't met yet, uh, I'm Brahim dahlstrom Hockey, part of the EDGE team. Uh, previous to joining Turk, I, I worked at Landmark College for a decade. Uh, that's a college for uh, the students who have learning disabilities, ADHD, autism, uh, and my work there focused on um, ways to teach STEM to that student population. And so um, the work I'm going to describe today actually started when I was still at Landmark College collaborating with um, Turk and uh, MIT at the time. Um, it came out of an ideas lab that uh, um, Jody and I met at, and um, you know this this sort of work has flown flowed out of it, and um, was most recently um, funded through the general fund this past year uh, for a publication based on some of the work that you're going to see today. Um, I'm going to try to move through things fairly quickly. If questions come up, please feel free to put them in the chat or or um, you know, ask them. Uh, I'll try to answer brief ones along the way. And if there are longer questions, there's time at the end for a more extended back and forth. And uh, I could stay on longer at the end, but I'll, I'll, I'd like to try to get through all the slides before too, so those that have other applications can, can move on to them. All right, so, um, so I'm going to start out by talking about assessments of neurodiverse learners, uh, where things are at, what are the challenges there. Uh, I'll give you a, a brief overview of how Data Arcade have ch has changed. I think many of you are already familiar with this, but uh, I'll, I'll do it briefly. Uh, and the, the design we used for this particular study We'll talk about our results and then an overview of what we think that means and, and where we go from here. All right, so let's start by talking about assessment of neurodiverse learners. And I think this is um, an area that I've been interested in for quite a while. And uh, it's, it's, um, it's really challenging, not just in STEM, but across the board. Um, many uh, neurodiverse learners really struggle with traditional assessments because those assessments are often not developed for that student population and rarely are they tested with that student population. Uh, traditionally, accommodations uh, are used to try to make these assessments more accessible there's quite a bit of literature out there that shows that accommodations don't always work and they, they certainly don't level the playing field either on the teaching side or the assessment side. Uh, typically what we see is high demands from uh, construct irrelevant factors. So on something like a STEM assessment, you have very high language demands and, and I had a paper published last year looking at that. Uh, and you also have very high executive function demands. So students either have to read fairly complex text, be familiar with, uh, with new terminology, uh, be able to decode new symbols, um, or you know, stay on task, manage frust frustration, regulate emotions, and so on. And while, while those things are important and desirable skills to develop. They don't tell me whether or not the student has the knowledge that I'm trying to assess. Um, there's also evidence that other struggling student populations exhibit uh, uh, difficulties with many standardized assessments. So English language learners have similar struggles with language processing. Uh, uh, other student populations, students of color uh, or from other cultural backgrounds will often struggle when the examples used or the language used isn't familiar to them. That imposes a higher cognitive load. Uh, 
on those learners. Uh, so um, this, this challenge is not new and it's been well recognized. And uh, in 2014, the standards for educational and psychological testing were really updated to reflect this, um, this understanding. And those standards have shifted the field since then to really consider validity not to be uh, sort of um, a property of the assessment in itself. So when you're talking about validity, even though we still use a validated instrument all the time, their perspective has been that uh, you really can't talk about a validated instrument you have to talk about an instrument that's valid for a certain purpose for a certain population. Uh, so that uh, uh, the, the question becomes, is this valid for assessing physics knowledge for students with disabilities, rather than is this a validated physics assessment? Um, that perspective also highlights the need for um, fairness and testing across all populations that will be reasonably expected to use those instruments. And that it's really the responsibility of the test developers and administrators to ensure that fairness. Uh, and that developers really have to be thinking about this from the very beginning and not something that, that comes after the fact once they've already developed an instrument where they're trying to create, uh, you know, um, some supports or, or add-ons to make that content accessible rather than developing something that's more broadly accessible to begin with. Um, now, these, these standards are in effect, but um, it's been challenging for the field to move in response to them. Uh, and a lot of traditional approaches don't lend themselves to this sort of broad access. Uh, so something like this might be a traditional physics assessment that uh, a student might see. And for a student who's neurodiverse, uh, there's a, a range of different challenges that they could be struggling with. The language is fairly complex to decode. Uh, there's a lot of symbolic uh, notation that they need to be able to understand. There's a lot of spatial reasoning demands that they need to um, to address. Uh, they have to split their attention between multiple locations here in terms of trying to understand the graphic with respect to what's being said in the text. Uh, all of these are, are pretty high demand tasks for neurodiverse learners. So in our project, we asked ourselves, well, what can we do with the work that we're taking part in? And what we focused on is trying to measure implicit knowledge or implicit learning. And again, I think many of us um, in this room have, have heard people on our team, certainly Jody's spoken about this and, and others on our team have spoken about uh, measuring implicit knowledge. Uh, and, and that is knowledge that a student may not be able to express or articulate on something like a formal assessment. Uh, but it's knowledge that they implicitly have and can act on. Um, a lot of the work uh, that's been done by EDGE in the past has used educational data mining to look at clickstream data and other behavioral data to, to identify automatic detectors of uh, uh, evidence for students' uh, knowledge acquisition. Um, this basically looks at students' performance in a digital environment. In our case, it's, it's a game-based game learning assessment approach um, where students are engaged and motivated. We don't have huge demands on language and executive function skills. Uh, we can collect all this data in a fairly unobtrusive, low-stress environment. Uh, so it, it sort of uh, tends to address many of the challenges that neurodiverse learners face on traditional assessment approaches. 
having said that, I will say that uh, I don't think there is a, an ideal assessment approach. So certainly uh, this type of assessment is not going to be ideal for all learners, but for a significant subset of learners that struggle with traditional approaches, this may be a viable alternative. Okay, uh, so, so what, what changes did we have to make to, to, to test this out uh, and uh, try it over the, the three years of our uh, project? So I think many of you are already familiar with the game Impulse, and that's, uh, that's the game we focused on for this particular project. Uh, the reason we chose Impulse, and, and we, had, um, we spent some time debating which game to use for this project, um, is because it's a fast action video game, which requires um, uh, players to deploy their eye movements strategically. And for this project, we were interested in seeing how eye movements improves our ability to, uh, to assess student knowledge. Uh, so because of the time constraint, um, it would be unlikely that students would be staring off randomly in different directions because they sort of really have to keep track of the game and, and where things are at. Uh, and that time pressure also means that any um, any time that impacts fixations is is likely meaningful because because there is a time pressure. So. It's, it's likely that uh, if a student lingers in a particular location, there's a reason for that. There, that there's additional processing ha happening there. So that's, that's meaningful for us versus uh, a more open-ended learning situation where you could take your time and it's possible that you're sort of daydreaming or staring off at a location thinking about something and there's no time pressure. Uh, so that, that's one of the reasons we chose Impulse. Um, now, in previous work using detectors, uh, we had come up with uh, a, a range of uh, strategies that were imposed. And this was done by uh, work by the Edge team prior to me joining the team, uh, looking at uh, a range of strategies on the left. And then, um, game-based indicators for those strategies and the types of implicit understanding that was implied by those indicators. Um, so again, this is mostly things you're familiar with, but uh, these were mostly distilled features based on hand coding that was done by the team. And this is what Data Arcade looked like uh, prior to this project. Uh, um, it involved hand labeling of these strategies and then mining the data to look for indicators uh, for those hand labeled um, uh, strategies. Now for this project, uh, we, we added several uh, components uh, to, the, um, to Data Arcade to allow us to do the type of work that we wanted to. First of all, we wanted to be able to import this multimodal data. Uh, so we had to rebuild the mechanism to allow for the importing of new data streams. And one of the, the um, we wanted to build something fairly open-ended. So Data Arcade can now accept data streams from virtually any digital device uh, that we can write code for through an open source library called Lab Streaming Layer. Um, we also had to build the games to be able to, um, to um, communicate with our back end using lab streaming layer so we could synchronize things tightly. Uh, and then we also developed a playback version of Data Arcade to allow us to visualize, uh, to replay players' uh, playthroughs and visualize these other components. So in uh, Data Arcade playback mode now, we can superimpose eye movement uh, allocations as players are playing the game and, and recreate all their uh, 
uh, actions in the game and at the same time sort of flag where the detectors are identifying the presence of, of uh, strategies in the game. Um, so, uh, um, so the component we added here is looking at whether eye movements add to this uh, to these measures that we already have and provide some evidence for implicit knowledge of, of Newtonian physics. Um, we ended up collecting data from a total of fifty nine participants. Uh, we actually um, had a total sample of 66, but we lost data from some of those participants. Uh, these were all neurodiverse students, mostly, I think, all recruited at the Landmark College campus. Uh, students began by filling out sort of a, a pretest survey. Um, uh, there's a seven question assessment of their physics knowledge. Um, and you know questions about demographics uh, and so on. After they fill that out, they play, play impulse for an hour while we log all their clickstream data and eye movement data. Uh, and um, you know that's basically what each of them participated in. While they're playing, we have these multiple data streams all going into Data Arcade. Um, and, and are being synchronized with the game events. Uh, we then took this new set of data and identified uh, a host of new eye features they're looking at. So things like um, where they're fixating on the screen, how long they're fixating at those locations, um, which objects are closest to uh, the fovea, which objects are within three degrees of visual angle of the fovea, and so on. And these, this new set of eye movement features form the basis for our new uh, detectors. Um, Given that we already had behavior-based detectors, uh, we also we were interested in sort of comparing the new measures uh, to two metrics. One is the information we already have from these physics pre-assessments uh, that they filled out at the beginning of the study. And the second one is how well these new measures compare to the uh, best detectors we had from the original work. All right, um, so uh, um, from, based on our prior work, uh, our best indicator for different, for uh, um, prior physics knowledge was differentiation of mass and a particular measure called NCLEC, where uh, students who, who seem to de demonstrate a a subsequent um, um, improvement in physics knowledge after bridging. Uh, typically, were also those students who demonstrated the most differentiation of mass. That is, that they collect correctly determined that objects of higher mass required more force to to, to act on them, and therefore clicked more on higher mass objects. Uh, whereas those participants who did not e exhibit that pattern or, or exhibited the opposite pattern generally did not demonstrate strong physics knowledge on subsequent assessments. Um, uh, so that was one of the metrics we were looking at. Um, we also wanted to take uh, the, the, the gaze patterns that students were exhibiting and uh, find a way to organize them. Uh, so we explored uh, different types of clustering methods and the one we ended up using and, and the clustering methods produced similar results, but we used the Gaussian mixture model clustering methods, uh, which ended up splitting up the data into three main groups. Group one ended up sort of being a middle, uh, a middle baseline group. So uh, about half or a little more than half of our 
participants ended up in this middle group. These students um, exhibited uh, gaze fixations on objects that were, you know, anywhere around three to four hundred milliseconds. Um, that is um, the length of time they fixated uh, objects of different mass because the different mass objects had different colors. Uh, and uh, we looked at how this pattern uh, differed across um, um, the object types. So at the bottom, you'll see blue. These are the lowest mass objects. Red are medium mass objects. White and gray actually both have the same high mass, uh, but the white objects are large, whereas the, the gray ones are small, even though they're both high, higher mass. Um, and if, if you look at the general pattern of the data, there is a slight increase, but it's fairly slight across these. So there may be some indication of differentiation of mass based on where they're looking, but not a strong pattern. Uh, group two uh, tended to have very, very fast short fixations and virtually no differentiation of mass. So these players tended to be really, really fast, reactive players. Um, they often um, tended to use more gamified strategies than physics-based strategies. And, and what I mean by that is uh, they would try to rush the ball into the, the target zone or um, sort of uh, intentionally crash the ball to reset until they got a, a fairly, because um, the game restarts in random states. They would just crash it until they found a random state that was relatively easy for them to, to be able to solve. So they weren't necessarily exhibiting an understanding of the particle dynamics. They were just gamifying, you know, uh, the system. Um, and then group three um, was the group that seemed to exhibit the longest fixations and uh, um, sort of a, a relatively um, a bit more of a trend of increase in terms of um, um, their deployment of gazes across uh, objects. So it wasn't the, the the slope differences across the groups were not statistically significant, but the total uh, gaze duration allocations were. Uh, and so we took these three clusters and we ran uh, an analysis. And essentially what this analysis does is it, it creates a baseline model that uh, just looks at all the data uh, not clustered into groups and then adds the grouping uh, of the data to see whether we get a better fitting model. Uh, and what we found was we do get a better fitting model and our cluster three, that's the group that performed highest, the group that had uh, sort of the longer gaze durations, also did statistically significantly better on our physics pre-assessment. So on average, they got one extra question right on that physics pre-assessment compared to the, the, the center group, that big group in the middle. Um, that uh, group two cluster that was at the very bottom of the screen that tend to have the very, very fast um, uh, gazes, the very short gazes, very quick gameplay, uh, those players tended to be marginally, um, did marginally better on the pretest, which was a bit surprising. However, it was not a statistically significant improvement over that, that baseline group. Any quick questions about this before I, I show the, the next set? I know I've been talking quite, quite a bit here. Okay, so I'll move on to the, to the rest of our data set. So that was the comparison of this new eye movement data to this pretest score, the, the pre-assessment score. And what we found was uh, 
by just looking at the overall pattern of eye movements uh, unique to each participant, we're able to statistically significantly predict, uh, identify a group that did significantly better on that pretest. And what's important here is to realize that the clustering is completely blind to their physics knowledge. The only thing the clustering knows is what their eye movement pattern looks like. And so that clustering produced a grouping that did better on the physics assessment, even though there is no, it has no access to the physics knowledge that these students had. Um, now, the, the challenge with using that pretest data is we have one score for the participant and an hour's worth of gameplay. And so we can't get a more nuanced analysis. Or we can say is based on how they did over an hour of play, this is the overall pattern they showed, and this seems to correlate with uh, how they did on that pretest. Um, but but we wanted to see if we could get down to more of a, a level by level analysis. And the only way we could do that is to use our previous uh, detectors. Uh, so we went back and looked at that end click detector. So again, as a reminder, this is the number of clicks you have on a particle of a certain type. And if you click more on, on high mass particles, that's an indicator that you have an understanding of, um, of, of the need to apply more force to move a higher mass object. Uh, so we took that as uh, our measure, and we wanted to see how our eye movement measures compared to this. Uh, so we, we started by taking the uh, gaze duration data um, we sort of um, centered and normalized the data. So, so we sort of um, um, uh, essentially created Z scores around a center of zero for how, how far uh, the gaze durations deviate from the average. Uh, and we looked at um, average gaze durations on objects of a particular type on a particular trial. So instead of now looking at the overall pattern across the whole experiment, we took one quick level, which usually only lasts a few seconds, you know, maybe 20 seconds, anywhere from a few to maybe 20 seconds or so. Um, and we looked at the average time they spent looking at the particles of different colors. And we wanted to see if um, these gaze durations had any association with the, the, the end click behavior. So we ended up uh, building three models. Um, our baseline model just uh, looks at the data uh, completely and has no knowledge of um, and the eye features or, or the, the particle types. We created a second model uh, that, um, that has particle type uh, to, to show that uh, essentially end clicks were affected by par particle type. So this was essentially a replication of the work we had previously shown. And we saw that there were very large statistically significant effects for particle color on the, the number of clicks that each particle type um, experienced. And that overall, uh, most participants tended to cl click more on the higher mass particles. Um, this is not true of all participants, but in general, that tended to be true. Um, and we got a much better fitting model doing that. We then added these normalized average gaze duration numbers to the model. And, uh, and that improved the fit over and above what we had before, which means that um, controlling for individual effects, controlling for what level they're at, and controlling for what particle type they're looking at, or, or sort of the data we already can get out of knowing that there are higher clicks on, uh, um, on uh, particles of a certain color 
uh, gaze durations were also predicted, added additional predictive power uh, over and above these measures, which means that, um, that even when we control for all these other factors, gazes still provide us uh, a, a statistically significant um, improvement in estimation of which, which particles they're likely to click at more um, than, than just knowing what the color is. Uh, and that is you know, associated with um, their, their understanding of physics as, as we've seen in prior work. So I, I know this is a, a little bit complicated. I hope I'm explaining it correctly. Um, Anybody have any question for me on, on exactly what this data is, is showing here? Okay. So what what does all of this mean? Uh, so, so we 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 ran these analysis. Um, we think we we found these statistical statistically significant effects, uh, and we think uh, we've now established um, using these two metrics that uh, eye movements are a viable means of providing additional information into um, the. Um, evidence that students have developed this implicit understanding of Newtonian physics. So obviously what we have here is not uh, a finalized assessment, but we have some promising evidence that shows that A, we can get statistically significant predictions of who's going to do better on these uh, physics item, pre-assessment items, and we can uh, provide a statistically significant improvement in estimating who's going to um, cl uh, click more on objects, which we believe is associated with an implicit understanding of physics. Um, and um, we have an alignment between the detectors we already have and these new eye measures, but they seem to provide additional knowledge over and above what we've detected in the past. Um, we do have now the backend infrastructure to collect these high resolution and synchronized data streams from any number of devices. So, so we've done it with eye trackers, but we can bring in EEG, we can bring in FNIRs, we can bring in emotion detection uh, algorithms, we can bring in uh, heart rate, breathing rate, anything, any of those measures we have access to, and we can uh, easily bring into any system that interfaces with Data Arcade. Uh, we now have the, these built-in playback and visualization capabilities that allow us to look at that data and uh, try to observe patterns to inform the development of these new detectors. Uh, and we now have evidence that uh, some of these features of eye movements that we've looked at are, show promise in, in, eye, in differentiating between different types of physics learners. Uh, so what we're hoping to do next is, um, one, uh, better explore this playback uh, uh, capability. And Elizabeth actually has, has written a, a proposal to really delve into this, this playback capability. And so we're going to be, hopefully, if that's funded, we're going to look more closely at um, that playback tool and making it useful to many of the stakeholders that, uh, that would have access to it. So not only um, its use as a research tool, but what aspects of it can be useful for uh, teachers, for example. Um, the second thing we're interested in is looking at um, uh, improved, so, so we've established the fact that eye movements seem to be able to give us uh, statistically significant indications of uh, improved physics knowledge. 
Uh, however, we don't have we don't have that assessment in place. So we'd like to do more work on developing a measure of physics knowledge based on these eye movement patterns. Um, we're also interested in looking at other data streams. So can we bring in um, emotion detection, which is something that we've been looking at for the INFACT project? Um, can we bring in uh, lower end eye tracking that can be done using webcams, which again is something we're looking at for the INFACT project? Uh, can we look at EEG and FNIRs uh, to detect things like uh, changes in um, mental effort or uh, attention or um, engagement uh, and use those to better inform uh, both our assessments and uh, the, the, the adaptation of the, the games to the needs of, of uh, the learners. So these are essentially the next steps of where we see this work going. Uh, and I think with that, I'll open things up for, for questions that anyone might have. Hey, Ibrahim, it's Teresa. Hi, how are you? <laughs> Good. Um, I have a question on your... Um, and the tools for actually data collection. So way back, um, and like, how does the, and like I'm, I'm interested in the eye tracker tool technology and how much, what's the, what's the lift involved in doing a study that has people using an eye tracker? And like, are, are they yeah. that, that it much improved the, t the tool? And then the second part of that question is like, how does that, work with a new world we might live in, in which you may not be able to bring people or go to people to um, yeah. do it in person. Yeah. It's a great, can I just ask that you stop sharing your screen so we can see? Oh yeah, yeah. sorry about that. Oh, well, yeah. There we go. Um, yeah, that, that's actually uh, a great question because it's one that we have on our minds as we move forward with the INFACT project. Um, um, so, in this particular project, uh, the eye tracker we use is sort of a, a high-end research-grade eye tracker. Um, uh, most of the data was collected at Landmark College. I think all the data you saw was collected at Landmark College, but we did collect some data at Turk. So it, it's uh, it's it's mobile enough to be able to take to a setting if you have a, a good room that has no light that you can sort of uh, have exclusive use of and be able to sort of turn it into a mini lab setting. You know, we, we took a conference room, we set it up in an hour. It wasn't that difficult to set up, but it, it requires some setup. Um, using the eye tracker itself is quite tricky because it's a finicky device. Um, it, it takes a bit of time and practice to be able to, um, to set somebody up on the eye tracker to make sure it's running correctly, to stop the experiment and, and recalibrate if things aren't going well. I mean, uh, you know, you need a, a little bit of practice. So I, I would definitely, if you're planning to do it, plan to do um, some training and run a pilot before you collect any real data uh, with this. Um, you also run into different categories of individuals that are very difficult to track. So, so first of all, uh, we ask, we typically ask anybody who's coming to not wear any makeup that day because eye makeup can make tracking difficult. So that's something you have to ask them to do or we sometimes will have makeup remover available and say, could you take off your makeup? Because we can't, it, 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 makes, uh, uh, it makes a big difference for tracking. So, so makeup is an issue, glasses is an issue. It's possible, but it's very difficult. So we ask participants, if at all possible, wear uh, you know, soft contact lenses. Uh, that works fine, but... Uh, but the reflection on the glass sometimes makes it really hard to track. Um, and 
with all that, there is a small subset of individuals for whom it just doesn't work. If you're super fidgety, it's really hard to track you. Having said that, many of these participants have ADHD, so we can do it, but there are, there's a small subset that are so fidgety, we just can't track them. Um, the, uh, if you have really, really light pupils, it's hard to, so, you know, there are, it's finicky. It's finicky, it's not that easy. Uh, and you certainly can't use these higher end eye trackers um, unsupervised. You have to have a researcher who's trained, who's in the room to run the actual eye tracker. What we are exploring right now for, in fact, is the use of webcam-based eye tracking in a, in a remote environment where no researcher is there, the participant is just sitting down at their keyboard doing the work that they need to do, and using the webcam, we're trying to, to track their eye movements. Um, we don't know yet how viable or useful that will be. We know that the accuracy is way worse than the high-end eye tracker, but we're hoping it's still good enough to give us something useful. Uh, I would say that you can, just looking at, at some quick data that we've connect, collected, you can assume um, an accuracy of about this size in terms of knowing generally where they're looking. But if you're trying to look at like, are they looking at a word or an object, you can't do that with the webcam based uh, instrument. So if you need something more fine grained, you're gonna have to go with the high end eye tracker with a researcher in the room. Does the size of the screen that you're looking at matter? Uh, it does because measures are based on degrees of visual angle, which is basically, you know, so the, uh, which, which depends on the size of the screen, but also how close it is to you. So, you know, so if you have an iPhone, but it's close up, it's different from, um, you know, a large screen that's further away. It's all about visual degree of visual angle. And you want something that, you want to have a screen that takes up a large chunk of their visual field if you want to get accurate, accurate data. Thank you. And I want to add that in InFact, we're using the, the, the advantage of the webcam is there may, we're, it's all exploratory still, but we may be able to use the same data stream to get their visual stuff, their emotion, mm -hmm. you know, their engagement, just there's so much um, richness to one stream if we can do that. Yeah. It did, are you also able to then capture, are there audio cues that you could also add into this data? Uh, absolutely. I don't know if the linguists or the linguists might be like, well, you have to use that. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, um, you know, again, in the study you just saw, that was all based on purely eye tracking data. But what we're exploring now is collecting what we can. So the webcam would include an audio stream. Um, some of the collaborators we're working with are already doing sort of uh, processing of discourse between you know, teams working in groups and so on. Uh, and there's certainly algorithms out there, uh, at least in terms of emotion detection, that look at not only facial features, but also the language that's used and the tone of the voice and, and so on. So, you know, that's something we're looking at. I'm not super familiar with that literature, but it's something that I'm, I'm reading up on right now. Brahim, question yeah. on here. Um, if, how much of the hour it was worth of data did you need to be getting the, the, the cohorts? In other words, do you really need the full hour or could you have done it in 20 minutes or you know how much how much data or do you even know yeah. that uh so i would say first of all um 
the, so the total time was an hour, but I would say at least 15 minutes was them doing that pre-survey and then setting up on the eye tracker and calibration and so on. So that, that probably on its own takes 15 minutes, you know, 20 minutes if, if things are complicated. Um, uh, now, of the, the gameplay data, we, we didn't end up using all of it. So it's certainly, I, I think it's reasonable to say that if we had uh, 20 minutes of good gameplay data after they had actually started playing, that that would give us, you know, uh, reasonable measures, reasonable amount of data to look at. Um, you know, uh, I, I don't know yet for sure, but I think that's a reasonable number. It would totally depend on the experience though. Mm, that would yeah. be for impulse. It depends on the length of the experience and how long it takes them to learn the experience until they're at a plateau of when you want to actually start collecting their data. And for the analyses that were presented here, we looked at, I think, levels 20 to 25 only. So even, even though we had 40 minutes of play, we only looked at a narrow slice and that was enough to do this work. Yeah. yeah. But you could, you could have gotten players up to level, um, the, um, so, but you're, you're talking at least a half hour of, of time, probably closer to 40, 45 minutes minimum, at least with the finicky high-end equipment. Yes, and you know, part of the, the reason we ignored that first part of the data is uh, there may be a lot of uh, learning of the game, but, but also uh, if we're assessing physics knowledge and that's changing over time, um, you know, we were looking at a broad assessment. We were looking at, uh, looking at, at their data as a whole, do we see evidence or not? We, we, our analysis was not fine-tuned enough to look at a, a time course change in their level. So that's something we'd love to look at down the line. Um, but we jumped sort of ahead to see, you know, um, for players who've played for a while, who seems to have developed well, this pattern and who hasn't. And, and at that point, they've had access to the, the balls of different masses. That was the other reason to pick later, that they'd, they'd had an opportunity to play with yes, the different yes. classes and learn yeah. about them, rather than earlier levels, which only had usually one. So. Makes sense. I have a question about the, the sort of explicitness of the physics that they are doing when playing the game. Like, do the students know that they're <laughs> using physics? I mean, like, it's a simulation, right? And so is there anything explicit there and then also, you know, I guess it really has to do with how good your model is at representing physical stuff. So, uh, I'll, so first of all, there's no um, teaching physics in the game. It's purely a game. Um, the study that we did this in was in outside of our, uh, the study we developed the game to do this in was in classes where the teacher then um, bridged and said, oh, you know what you did in that? Let me tell you what Newton said. So that was the purpose of the game or how it was designed. Um, this study used it in a different setting for a different reason. Um, <clears throat> but there, so there's no teaching except, but it was used to build explicit contests, to demonstrate that as a proof of concept, the idea of building and supporting in exposing implicit knowledge that then could be used for explicit knowledge in the classroom. So I'm thinking if I'm a researcher who's doing a project on teaching and learning physics, and I'm going to design my own assessment as part of my research, do you have any advice for me based on your findings? I know they're exploratory and preliminary, but can you tell me something about what I should do? Not that I do research on physics learning, but. Um, so, um... You know, especially when working with, with uh, uh, neurodiverse or other struggling populations of learners, one of the biggest challenges is assessments. And this is something we, every time I write a proposal to NSF targeting this population, I'm tearing my hair out. Because on the one hand, they want some established, well-validated measures, and, and rightly so. And on the other hand, none of 
them can assess the knowledge I want to measure for the student population. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so you know, so so I think there's a there's a large need here. Ideally, what um, the approach that that we've tried to take is to find ways to help students demonstrate that they've acquired the knowledge without having to say it or write it down. Uh, so demonstrated by doing. And whether it's doing in a game or a simulation, or even if you take a set of physics items or, or items in another contest and you turn them into a little um, scenario that they have to actively solve, I think that goes a long way to reducing some of the language and executive function barriers that, uh, that impose. And, and actually, I, I think um, the items from the, the that, that um, Jody and Elizabeth adapted from the force concept inventory do a good job of taking items that, that were developed in one way, but trying to make them a bit more accessible. And, um, uh, uh, so, you know, the one that comes to mind is uh, the astronaut uh, picture where um, uh, 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 it's uh, where you, uh, I'm trying to remember. We set up a video. Uh, we had a video from the astronauts and it was when they're in the space station, they line up three balls of different mass and then they're about to blow on them and they're weightless. They're just hanging there. And so you set the, you watch it set it up and then we stop and we ask them to make a prediction of pi which picture would come after this. Mm -hmm. um, depend and so, so we just, we used a lot of video and visuals to recreate the, the um, questions that were already on standardized tests. So. Thank you. But I think the, the reason why we went to the, so there's two answers to your question. One is if you have the time and space available to, to do the assessment yourself, <laughs> and then that's a way of doing it. And then there's the scalable replicable approach, which, which digital environments and digital logs afford. And that's what we were trying to exploit. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? I was a little bit curious. This is Sarah. I was a little bit curious about the um, game setup and how students interpreted volume versus mass and whether they thought maybe some colors were lighter objects instead of heavier objects and like how did they sort that out or how did you know what they were thinking we purposely had we had four different balls small medium large going with same density so the mass scaled and then the, the heaviest ball went was the smallest so there was a very heavy dense ball and the mass differentiation stuck with that heavy dense ball so they they treated that one as the heaviest not the largest even though it was the smallest if you know what i mean so and how did they find that out by experience oh okay. experience that's that's why elizabeth was saying we didn't measure until they had already had experience playing with all the balls Oh, oh, I see. Each ball was introduced, but it, but we didn't say this one is heavier than the last one, and this one has bits, and we didn't say right. none of that was. And, and there's no use of any terminology. There's no instructions. There's no, you just play the game and do what you're going to do. You don't talk about volume or mass or density. None of that is built into the game. And these are college age students? In this study, they were, yes. Uh, they right. were sort of first year college uh, students. Uh, however, the prior work was, was uh, with- High school. High school. Thank you. The prior work just, so this all builds from the leveling up project, which we edged did from 2011 to 2015. And all the papers are there and we can follow up. But that, that was that work. And then Ibrahim built on that work to add the eye tracking. Ibrahim and Elizabeth in the end. 
<laughs> so Ibrahim, Ibrahim I, I was uh, very curious at the very beginning when you started describing sort of the role of assessments and you just mentioned it in your response to Jennifer, mm -hmm. sort of the validation issue. Yeah. I mean, uh, I wrote to a place that we used to talk a lot about, you mm -hmm. know, assessment validation, but then you mentioned this idea of validation, not just being for like any test as a property of the test, but for the purpose for, and the audience of the assessment, right? And I'm wondering, well, it makes a lot of sense to me now that you've said it out loud, <laughs> but um, it's like a radical, is that a radical idea in assessment or is that? I don't no. think so. I mean, if it's, it's now the joint mm -hmm. uh, sort of policy of APA, uh, mm -hmm. APRA and uh, NCME. So mm -hmm. all three now adopt that as their official policy. So I don't think it's sort of a radical idea anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, what I, I, I think the challenge is implementing it. So I think that the, the policy has been accepted, but, um, but how exactly to implement it is, is, uh, is a challenge and many test developers and sort of uh, sort of mainstream retail, you know, developers of psychological assessments and academic assessments and so on are used to doing things a certain way. And this is a radical idea for them. But I think at least from the research academic field, it's, it's, it's sort of the, the policy that's been widely accepted. So the other thing about um, even in that document, the most of the biases, when they try to look at whether or not there's biases, are focused on gender and race. Mm -hmm. They're not focused mm -hmm. on disability at all. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. So, yeah. so I don't know how much the, the focus on neurodiverse is actually woven into those standards because their bias measures are always, they're not about that. Yeah, no. yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Even though, I mean, the language does include disability, but, but very few of the work looks at disability and even less actually develops it explicitly into their testing or development. So Ibrahim, it's Maria here. Um, I was just actually wondering about implementation and how difficult that might be. So do you, what, what is your sense of a trajectory of how those issues can get resolved? Um, you know, there's probably access to these types of tools. There's how teachers or testers use them, things like that. Where, where is that headed? Um, so my personal opinion is uh, it, it, has to, it has to be there from day one, right? You have to go into this saying whatever I develop has to work for this population or, the, or these populations. And if it doesn't, then I'm not I, you know, I can't move forward with, with testing. What I'm developing is, is, is something that needs to be rethought or redesigned. I think the, 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 what I hear a lot from developers is, well, you know, there's so many things I have to tackle right now that I really can't think of this population until sometime down the line. Let me, let me, like develop it and test it with some neurotypical students or average students wherever I can. And then once it's, it's looking good, then let's test it with these other populations. I would argue that you should go the opposite direction. Build something that works for those sort of hardest to reach students. And if it's working for them, then go back and see, well, okay, well, does this work for that average learner or you know, do I need to adapt it a little bit for that average learner? Because I think you're more likely to catch a broader audience if you if you look at those outside the 95th percentile and meet their needs than if you stay within that center group. Uh, and, and, you know, um, I think many of, of your Many students, you know, if you look at average studies, regardless of what instructional approach you use, as long as it's halfway decent, you catch two thirds of the students anyway. So I, I think building something that works for the students that already do well, regardless of what approach you use, uh, should not be your starting point. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> 
And usually what you find is that when what you thought was the 95% average actually wasn't there anyway, and everybody kind of wants the scaffolds that you set up exactly. for everybody else. <laughs> yeah. All right, so it, it's, it's two o'clock now. Uh, so I think that the time is officially over. If anybody else has follow-up questions or anything they want to delve more deeply into, I'll hang around for a couple of more minutes or we can take this offline and I can have a one-on-one -on -one or a follow-up discussion with you. Okay. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks everybody. <laughs>